Welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Greg Clark. I am a associate professor here in the Department of Biomedical Engineering in the College of Engineering at the University of Utah. And I'm the director of the Center for Neural Interfaces and we'll talk about neural interfaces today. Uh, welcome, thank you for joining us uh, to learn a little bit about the field, to learn a little bit about your opportunities here at the University of Utah. Here are some pictures of, that basically capture the essence of what we're trying to do, which I'm gonna tell you a little bit about today. And the easiest way to explain it is to sensationalize it just a little bit and reach out and say, we're trying to do the Luke Skywalker thing. This is the Luke arm made by a company called not by us, and we don't make this arm, but what our job is, is to attach this arm to the person's own neuromuscular system. And that way they can move the arm intuitively just by thinking about it. And importantly, they can also get sensors back on the arm. If we talk to the nerve fibers in their arm, they can also get the senses of, of touch and the senses of movement, and ideally even the sense of being whole again. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to restore almost as if it's their biological hand. So before going into that, um, I have to do what uh, engineers and uh, other tech people often have to do. I have to declare conflicts of interest. So I now own several patents, which somewhat surprises me on uh, improvements to these technologies. So we take our devices, we bring them into the lab. I didn't invent the Utah Array, the device I'll tell you about, but a colleague did, Richard Norman, but I've contributed to some improvements in modest ways. And we patent those. And the reason we patent those is not to get a lot of money. The reason we patent those is because we want these devices to go out into the real world and help people. So our work here, our research is basic research. It's funded by you, thank you very much. It's funded by society. But a business is funded by selling stuff, right? And so for them, the business is to take our, our research developments and translate those into commercial and clinical practice it takes tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, sometimes millions of dollars. And to do that, they have to have their intellectual property protected. So uh, that's why we do this. Um, but our real goal is, is to help people. And let me tell you a little bit about the field of biomedical engineering, my home department. That's not a traditional engineering field, but it actually has a long tradition and a long history. So some of you may know this guy, Wilhelm Kolb, and you may know that he invented the artificial heart. He led the team uh, that, that developed the artificial heart here at the University of Utah. He wasn't the only member of the team. For example, another key player was Clifford Blanquette, who really made some major developments in the heart, but this is where it was first implemented. Now shown on upper left here is this other invention, which is the artificial kidney. Now, even if you've never had any renal physiology, you know that doesn't look like a kidney, right? Kidney looks like a kidney bean. So why the heck does this work? It works because he was able to capture the essential principles. And so this is what's important for inventors and developers, capture the essence of a problem and then translate the essence of that. And then through engineering iteration, it gets better and better and better. But the first thing you do is go for the key principles. So this guy, he's, a, he's an ME. He's called into the hospital, mechanical engineer. He's called into the hospital, not to help children, but to fix the air conditioning. But he sees these children, they can't breathe. Right, they're literally dying because to, to move, to, to breathe, you have to move your, your skeletal muscle and they were paralyzed. So they couldn't move their skeletal muscles. So they were, they were asphyxiating, right? And you could see them struggling. You could see them dying slowly. And, and it was horrible, right? And there's some scary parallels to what's going on in the world today. So he said, I'm an engineer, I can do this. I can do this. And so he invented a machine called the iron lung and, and, and it just created a vacuum and the vacuum expanded the chest and expanded the lungs and then the vacuum let off and, and the lungs were allowed to relax and over and over and over. He saved thousands and thousands of lives that, that would have perished otherwise in rather horrible ways. So engineering helps people. Engineering is a can do, we can do this kind of discipline. And what we're gonna be training you here at the University of Utah is how to do stuff 
right? Not only just how to understand stuff, that's important because if you don't understand it, you can't do it, but also how to translate that into the real world. And that's really, really key. So um, uh, let's talk just a bit about biomedical engineering or bioengineering. So what is that? Um, it, it's not a traditional field, but I love this definition from the Urban Dictionary. A bioengineer is someone who has such substantial skills in both medicine and engineering. They can dare to combine them to form an entirely new profession. They deal with any device applied to the medical world, and they work on advancing technologies, not just using them, advancing them, or the best part, basically heroes in the modern world. Okay, that's a little gratuitous, but to some extent, that is what we're trying to do. So you're familiar with um, this notion of lifelong learning, and engineering really does allow you to continue to go out there in the real world. I love this quote from Albert Schweitzer. I don't know what your destiny is going to be, but one thing I do know, the only ones among you who will be really happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. And as I've said, engineering helps people, not just biomedical engineering, all the engineering disciplines in one way or another impact on the world in which we live. And so we help people. Or as uh, Catherine Dreger said, a physician who's treating COVID patients these days, as hard as the facts may be, knowledge will make us less afraid. So that's what we're trying to do is give you knowledge and give you the ability to translate that into ways to help people. So let's go back to what my lab is mostly working as one way to help people. And, and the best way to think about that is kind of this empathy uh, experiment is put yourself in the place of someone. This is uh, Matthew Beckstead. He uh, was working on a, a, a billboard. He reached out with an electrical, uh, with a metal piece he'd taken off the billboard and there was a power line illegally too close shocked himself, fell out of the sky, literally on fire. An EMT guy by chance was driving by, picked him up, rushed him to the hospital, he wakes up. So imagine you wake up and he has no hands. So what would you do, you know, just in a practical sense? How would you pick up a fork to hold your, uh, uh, to feed yourself? How would you tie your shoes to dress yourself? How would you play with your kid? Another important part of this is the sense of feeling. We underappreciate that, but but this feeling only, not only guides our hands in a practical sense, but it's a way that we explore and understand our world. We reach out and we hold the hands of someone we love. And so we want to restore this sense of feeling and even more so the sense of feeling whole again. As one of our subjects said, losing a hand is like losing someone you love, except you're reminded of it every single day. So. <laughs>
So it's translatable to the real world. Going the other way, when the hand reaches out and touches the grape, that activates sensors in the hand, right? And those sensors put out a voltage. We're engineers, we can take those voltages, translate them into the digital pulse code that the nerves would normally send up to the brain. Okay, and if we, if we provide the right spatial temporal pattern that's biomimetic, then the brain understands it because it's getting the same signal it would have gotten, except we're sending it instead of the sensors in the, the skin, we're sending it from the sensors in the, uh, the artificial hand. So the brain gets these signals and it understands them and we can provide over a hundred different signals for different parts of the fingers of different types of pressure and vibration and, and movement. Um, and, and so this provides a way to talk back to the brain very realistically. And then when we put it together, that's where the magic happens, right? And so that's what your body does. It's a sensory motor experience that's bi-directional and interactive. And so the person's able to engage in real world activities of daily living effectively. They're able to embody this arm into their own body image and it feels like it's part of their body subjectively and even though intellectually they know it isn't. And when that happens, other things happen, such as example, a reduction of uh, phantom pain, which we'll talk about. So that's our job is to create not only an artificial hand, but a hand that feels like the person's own hand. So, uh, you know, a key part of this is not only the engineering technology and, and the engineering um, dimensions of uh, motor and sensory function, but also the subjective ones. These are people, we're dealing with people. And so the cognitive and emotional functions and the restoration of those parts of their lives are really important too. Um, a, a fun tweet that we got was from Mark Hamill, which as you may know, was the actor for, for Star Wars, right? He played Luke. And, and he uh, quoted our, one of our participants, uh, Kevin Wolgema here, who was a great participant who worked with us for a really long time. He said, uh, Kevin said, I never thought I'd be able to feel in that hand again. It almost put me to tears, said the recipient of the Luke arm. Same here, says Mark Hamill. I've had a gibbon named after me, a pen, a piss dispenser, an electric toothbrush, and an under ruse, nothing is more satisfying than this, being able to help and inspire people. And that's what we're trying to do. And that's what you will be able to do to come here to the University of Utah College of Engineering. So let me introduce you to one of our subjects. This is Perry Pezzarossi, uh, as shown up here. He had major damage to his wrist, an injury while he was uh, in service. And uh, as I've mentioned already, Right, your fingers are kind of puppets. The muscles are in your arm, but if the tendons can't go through your wrist, your fingers can't move. So he couldn't move his hand. Couldn't move it, right? The muscles would contract, but his fingers wouldn't move. And worst of all, it felt really, really painful. So it's the worst of both worlds, right? You can't move it and it hurts. Doesn't work, but it's awful to have it. So he underwent an electric, uh, elective amputation. That means he chose to have his hand removed, or as he said, his terms, chop and swap. Um, and while he did that, we also had the opportunity to engage in the experiment. So we put these electrodes into his arm nerves. Those are the biological wires that connect the brain and the body. Uh, we also put these EMG electrodes into the muscle of his arm to collect the electrical signals. And then we recorded stuff. So here's the digital pulses uh, from one biological wire, wire, one nerve fiber, you can see it's all or none, right? It goes and we can count that. And we also get uh, digital pulses out of the muscles and we can uh, compute those and turn those into power and use those to drive the movement of the prosthetic arm. And to do that, we need to have some sort of uh, computational program. And so a big part of our research efforts are to determine the right kind of uh, computation. So this is a a symbol representing a neural network, artificial neural networks that you may have heard about. Um, but we have other approaches as well, such as uh, traditional engineering Hallman filters. And we, our, our goal is basically whatever works best. Uh, and, and that's sometimes up to the subject. So how do we teach the computer how to do that? Good question, glad you asked. Um, we don't know what's going on in their heads. So what we do is we take, one of the things we do is we take the arm and we control the arm, we make the arm move. 
and then we tell the subject, move your phantom hand the same way. So here's Perry with uh, this portable computer called a Nomad uh, made by Ripple. Um, and, and he's uh, just watching the hand, we're controlling the hand. And when the hand does thumb extension, he moves his phantom the same way, index finger, index extension, so forth and so on. So now we know what the movement's supposed to be. We know what the electrical activity is supposed to be and we can mix the match those together, right? And so now, after we've got that information, the computer can chunk it, and now he's controlling the hand here, right? And he's just thinking about moving his digits in a particular way, and the hand just does it, right? Because the computers learn that relationship. Here. Good girl, did you get it? And we didn't drop it. There you go. Good girl. So he loves this Oh, dog. yeah. And we love being able to interact. Stuff on your snap. More no more. No, you like this hand now. Um, and we were able to visit him at his home where he could try it out under supervised use and he could do all sorts of tasks he wasn't able to do before. Tying your shoes takes two hands. It's uh, you know pretty hard to do. He goes, if I could do this, it would be a miracle, but he does it. Um, locking the door, you would think is a one hand thing, but if your door sticks, you need one hand to pull the door and the other to turn the key. Um, but he was able to do that. Um, he was able to control the hand very precisely and do things that uh, he didn't think he would be able to do. Hey, honey, yeah. I'm gonna try to lock the door from the outside because you know I can't. Okay. So here he's trying to do something he can't normally do with his commercial hand. I can't, do I can't do that with the owl for sure. I is a commercial hand. I can't lock it because I can't pull it. Because I need two hands to do it. And now it's locked. And so that's what we're trying to do. Allow people, right? Doors opening and closing. We want to open doors for people. We want them to be able to do stuff on their own rather than rely on other people and to do it effectively and intuitively and naturally. So it feels not like a burden, but part of their regular life, just like it used to be. So what about sensation? Going back the other way, I've already told you the basic idea is that we stimulate the nerve fibers and the person feels the signals come up to their brain because the electrical pulses are the same kind of electrical pulses. So the brain interprets them. So um, the subject will actually feel their hand. Um, and so they can tell us where they feel it. They can tell us how they feel it. Is it vibration, pressure, tingle? Is it a sense of contraction in their muscle? They can tell us whether it's weak or strong. We can't measure those things, right? They have to tell us, but we have ways to find out that they're telling us the truth. Uh, test false positives versus uh, false negatives. And, and they really do experience them because we can give the stimuli they don't know what they are, but they can tell us what they are from the sense of touch that they're getting back. So um, this is sort of fun. This is literally the first time Kevin Walgamot felt this. And we were a little scared at first because he goes, ooh, and we go, oh my gosh, maybe, I don't know, maybe we're hitting a pain fiber or something, right? Maybe we're hurting him. We don't want to do that. And so we go, oh, we'll turn it down. He goes, no, 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 I like it, I like it. So let him, I'll let you just let him tell that. So the first time ever. Ooh. What's up that? that? What's up that? Oh yeah. yeah. Hang on again. Turn the frequency down. Oh, yeah. Turn the frequency down. Yeah. Let's do. I don't need to do that. Do you I like don't do that. That was great. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so we, we were able to proceed and map out these hundreds of different percepts. Um, and interestingly enough, when we did that, this other thing happened, which is this imaginary hand that he has is kind of like imaginary sight that you have in your blind spot. Your brain just fills it in. So they fill up, the brain fills in this missing hand, it hurts. And he goes, but you know, now when I'm in this experiment, it doesn't hurt so much when I move it. Um, and so David Page, a graduate student says, uh, you know, you think that the experiment affected your fan of pain? And he goes, yeah, it lessened it. I describe that as feeling more natural. And so I say, that's great. That's one of our hopes. Oh, not right? Not necessarily reality yet, but it is. It's not a promise, but if we restore sensory and motor function to him and to others, then the real prosthetic hand will become your hand, become your hand. And then the phantom won't have a place to live anymore. But the phantom doesn't have a place to live anymore. 
the pain doesn't have a place in it anymore. So that's the idea. And he goes, oh yeah, just like Luke Skywalker, then everybody will want one. Yeah, and, uh, and that's the goal, to get this to as many people as possible. So here he is talking about it. It has always been odd and weird, but uh, uh, it hurts a lot, so I sometimes wish it would go away, but uh, it's always there, so I can always feel it. One of the things that the robot hand helped with was when I would go there and I would, I would work at electrical stimulation here and then use of the hand help that go away for a couple of hours. And so it was very nice. It would be a relief. It yes. leave you. Yes. So uh, I'm an engineer, got to show you some numbers. Uh, here's three different graphs, three different manipulations with stimulation, sensory, motor, and both. And in all cases, the pain went down. Now it didn't go down a whole lot, but it did go down. It was reliable, what we call statistically significant. Couldn't happen from chance alone, very unlikely. And it was a modest effect, but right, it was only after an hour, two hours. And the hope is that if he gets to take it home or others like him get to take it home and they use it all the time, right? They use it eight hours a day, every day of the week, then the pain reduction will be even more. So there's another interesting thing that happens is that when they use it and the hand moves when they think about it, when, when the hand touches something, they feel it. Your brain basically short circuits and says like, you know, artificial things don't do that. That must be my hand. Intellectually, they understand it's not their hand, but emotionally, uh, it's subjectively, it feels like their hand. And so um, we, they start talking about it like um, in, in natural ways. It's the first time I've seen my hand move. That's not his hand, right? It feels like I'm moving a hand. So uh, here's an experiment we did. It's kind of complicated, but uh, there's a fake hand here, which he can see, and he can also move, and he can also get a sense of touchback uh, from the hand. Um, and, and so we ask him, now close your eyes and take your right hand, your intact biological hand, and slide it over to where you think your, your, your other hand is. And his amputated hand's way over here, right? The prosthetic hand is over here. So there's two possibilities, right, in the limit condition. One is he can take his intact hand and slide it across and go all the way over to where his actual biological arm is. Or alternatively, if he's incorporated the prosthetic hand, he'd stop where his prosthetic hand is, right? You get the idea, right? You can all do this. You can close your eyes and match up your hands. How do you know where your other hand is? You have this body sense that's created by your brain. And, and so what happens is when he does this with his eyes closed, he matches it up where his prosthetic hand is. That's where he feels his hand is. So, so now it's <laughs> his eyes, right? And, and, and what happens? He kind of sees, well, wait a minute. You know, my, my, my biological arm is actually over there. I can see that with my eyes. But my prosthetic arm has taken over my sense of, of where my body is. And it feels as if it's here. And, and so uh, that's what he does. He goes, that's really strange. Yeah, that's strange. What's strange? I can feel my hand on the other side. I can't feel my hand over there anymore. On the other side of this. Yeah, probably my arm. I, I feel yeah. it over it's here. It's moved over to the, to the hand here. It's moved over it's to moving this. moving over to this. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty strange. <laughs> and he laughs. He goes, I don't know if I like I don't know if I like you guys controlling. <laughs> <laughs> We're messing with your head, I'm sorry. <laughs> all right. We have your all mixed up. Right? We all mixed up. Do you like that? Yeah. I like that? Great. Yeah. It feels great to have your body back again. So uh, but most poignant of all perhaps was this. The end of the experiment, we ask him if there's anything he wants to do, and he goes, Yeah, I want to feel my hand again. I want to reach out and clasp my hands together. So he does. Is there anything you oh, want to grasp there. that you that you see? I want to clasp my you hands. To you can clasp your hands together if you want. Good. Reaches out, and feels <laughs> one's missing hand coming as if it's coming back alive. That was a really poignant moment for him, a really poignant moment for us. 
So he was very excited about this sensitivity. Uh, it certainly allowed him to do things in the real world. Uh, you'll notice that when he touches the egg, the stimulation turns on on this computer screen, and then he knows he can pick it up. So he reaches out, he touches it, um, the stimulation turns on, that means he can feel that, picks it up, right? He does it gently, right? Um, he can hammer, right? You need to hold the hand carefully. Um, he could put on his wedding ring, which is something he wanted to be able to do. That's a really difficult thing to do with just one hand. It's easier with two hands. And most importantly, as cool as it is to be able to touch your own hand, it's even more poignant to be able to reach out and feel my hand. Oh, you haven't been able to hold hands with that hand over time. So that was a truly poignant moment, and for him as well. So it's not only about the practicality, so those are important. It's not only about dexterity, it's not only even about the sense of touch. It's the sense of restoring your body so that it feels like their real self is, is working with them. Whereas one of our subjects said, God, that's so cool. Uh, this seems really boring, but this few words here are super exciting to us. That's an application that got approved. I hope your application to the U gets approved and you get admitted. Um, it says we can now translate this work into the real world. We can do these experiments in, in, in the real world. We can be, give people these to take home. So the hope is that when they take them home, they'll really get to use them in real ways. Uh, maybe one day these will be electronic. They can use them for a long period of time and incorporate them into their own bodies. Um, and so it's not only a primitive prosthetic becoming an advanced prosthesis, but an advanced prosthesis becoming as if it's their own hand. So allow me in our remaining minutes to uh, introduce you to the lab a little bit um, and some other projects or related projects. Uh, this comes from this video, um, which you can watch at the Center for Neural Interfaces website. Uh, I'll just show you some snippets of it or some projects that are shown in that. This is Eric Stone. Uh, he's now a second year graduate student. He's engaged in this uh, leap motion um, way of training the hand that was also developed by Troy Tully. Troy actually was the person, one of the primary persons who developed this along with um, Jake George. Troy was an undergraduate working with us and he's now translated that into being a graduate student there. We've had uh, over a dozen undergraduates working with us over the last year or two. Um, and, and the motion uh, camera captures the hand movement and then we can translate those into um, the uh, relationship to the activity patterns. So this is a motion tracking this. camera that will track the movements of my hand and we have the prosthetic hand set up to follow what I do. So we use this uh, as a way to help amputees, uh, help the computer understand the way that amputees move. Um, another cool thing uh, that I'm asking is bypass socket. Um, and, and this allows anybody to wear uh, the, the loop arm. Mike is very dedicated to our project, but he's not gonna have his hand amputated. And so now uh, we can do experiments with normal people. If you're over 18 years old and a legal adult, you can consent to sign up uh, for our experiments. It's kind of fun to be able to control the loop arm with the electrical activity. We do that with surface EMG electrodes, uh, we all do it to ourselves. Uh, it's just an electrical sleeve that I'll show you later. Uh, maybe I'll show you now. Right? You just, let, you just put on this, this, this uh, little sleeve here and the electrical grommets uh, touch your skin and we can record that electrical activity. Um, so uh, um, he's done that. By recording that muscle activity, we can actually train it with this computer to control this prosthetic hand. Um, in a very intuitive way. So uh, the prosthetics, la prótesis, está copiando las maniobras de tus dedos. Claro. Will the hand in it? And here's Taylor. He's working with a different hand. This is Taylor Hansen working with Dave Warren. Uh, this hand has sensors built in. And what's, what's a little different about this project is we're trying to give the hand some intelligence. So the information comes from the sensors, and then some of that information controls the hand, not entirely, right? You don't want a Dr. Strangelove thing, but partially. And so the, the robot works together with the person to form this kind of hybrid, right? This, this bionic person. 
so that they get the best of both worlds, the robotic precision, but also their own self-control. So what we're trying to do is a lot of amputees struggle to maintain a stable grasp on objects. They either imagine grabbing a cup, you're worried about grabbing it too hard and crushing it, or from there you're worried about dropping it if you let go too much. So um, without a sense of touch, this is very difficult. Ahí y me da la mano sin que sea muy fuerte y con un sentido de tacto. And then Mark uh, Britton is a, a postdoc. He's just left for a faculty position. He's the body itself is full of nerves, and nerves are just wires. As an electrical engineer, one of the things I've always been fascinated with is how you can use a machine to hack the system and, <laughs> and, and help the body do interesting things. They are remarkable. The engineers and the doctors that did this are just, they're, they're amazing. I, I can't figure out how they did it. I just know it worked. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of amputees, actually, after they have their arm removed, the nerves are looking for a place to be happy, and so some of the nerves that used to go to the hand will come on the surface of the skin. And so you can take electrodes um, and put it on the surface of the mm -hmm. skin. And now as I touch on the finger, I want you to tell me which finger I'm touching. El indice. You are touching this finger. Correct. Me estás tocando ahora el pulgar, sí. So not everybody wants things implanted in our, their body. So one of the things as engineers, you know, we can do a lot of stuff technologically, but ultimately we're working with people and they get to choose. And so we want to provide lots of different options, you know, more precise invasive approaches, but also um, the useful um, but, but less uh, invasive approaches that some people prefer. Um, so, so here's Jake George. He was an undergraduate working with us one summer, turned into a grad student, and then on from that, he's worked together with Anna Niebling, who's also a graduate, uh, sorry, who also was an undergraduate and uh, helped us uh, develop these um, EMG sleeves. Uh, and, and here... So what we're going to do is we're going to have you slide this on your forearm. Okay. And we're going to record the activity from your forearm. Yes. And translate that into um, movement of the prosthetic. And then uh, they go into your muscles here. Yeah, and then your forward. muscles actually it's have electrical like activity like that then causes, here. that actually causes the movements of your hand. Yeah, so even if you lost your hand, you would still have this electrical activity in your forearm. Se notan la variación de los colores en cuanto empuño la mano. Ahí ven. Now try doing another movement, so like opening your hand, like open your hand as much as you can. So you can see it's a different pattern. Sí. So the different patterns are kind of what we're teaching the computer to recognize. <laughs> oh, I feel accomplished. All right, bro. Yes. Fantastic. Que buena. Yeah. <laughs> Let me close with this fun little video clip. Uh, it's, it's a little hokey, but fun is good too, right? So. It's called the Luke Hand. Its movements are controlled by thoughts. It can sense different surfaces, which gives it a delicate touch. Engineers at the University of Utah and its contributing partners are giving new hope to amputees. What will you imagine and do? So I hope you imagine yourselves coming to the University of Utah, and I hope you do come to the University of Utah. I thank my many collaborators. There's all sorts of people that help on these projects. The good news is this is a really collaborative, helpful university. 
people that love to reach out and interact. Uh, I can't go through them all, but that's the big one. Thanks to our volunteers. Thank you for your attention. And I'd be happy to answer any questions in the minute or two we got left or feel free to email me. It's just my name, greg.clark at utah.edu. And I hope to see you all here someday. Thanks so much.